Hello, everybody. We're just waiting for people to finish entering the uh, webinar room. So we'll start in just a moment. Thank you. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. We've got a few people still uh, coming in, but uh, I think we'll begin. Um, so my name is Tom Keating. Uh, I'm Director of Rusi's Centre for Financial Crime and Security Studies here in London. Uh, it's my pleasure to moderate uh, today's uh, session. Before getting started, I just ask you to please absorb the housekeeping, housekeeping points on the screen uh, and note that the full webinar, including the Q&A, uh, is being recorded. If you want to ask a question, I think we all know the drill by now, but please pose it in writing in the Q&A uh, box that you can find uh, on the Zoom window. And do please include your name and organizational uh, affiliation to help us give us a sense of where you are coming from. Uh, just a quick line on us at uh, RUSI. So I'm sure most of you will be familiar with our program here. Uh, but for those of you who are not, we established our centre in 2014 with the aim of studying issues uh, at the intersection of finance and security, including, of course, not just the threats in front of us today, uh, but also the new challenges we may face in the years ahead. So uh, it is therefore a great pleasure today to welcome Lisa Osofsky, Director of the Serious Fraud Office, to talk about just that particular challenge from her perspective at the helm of the SFO, and we hope to lay out how the SFO might face down these challenges and perhaps what help the SFO is going to need in meeting these challenges. As for Lisa's experience, I will limit myself to noting that it's just over two years since she took the helm at the SFO in August 2018, bringing with her over 30 years of varied experience pursuing and protecting against financial crime in both the public and the private sectors in the UK and indeed also in the United States. So the plan then for the rest of this hour is that Lisa will make her presentation for about 25 or so minutes, uh, and then we'll turn to discussion and Q&A from you all as attendees. So as I say, do please be sure to enter your questions online as we progress. So with all that done, uh, I'd like to turn the floor over to Lisa uh, for her remarks. Uh, Lisa, welcome, and thanks for coming back to RUSI uh, uh, again this year. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to speak today on future challenges in economic crime. There are quite a few of them. And of course, that means lots of opportunities as well. Some of the challenges are the familiar ones with which we've been wrestling for years. Some go as far back as over the 25 years when I was seconded to the SFO at the time I was a US Department of Justice employee. Some are newer. And I wanna start by acknowledging the positive developments in this area. For instance, economic crime has moved higher up the political agenda than it's been for some time. And there is a focus, a renewed focus on tackling fraud. That's good for us. This highlights the importance of strengthening the UK's economic security and prosperity as we respond to the way that criminals of all types exploit both the global pandemic and the changes in our relationships with the EU and the rest of the world. The SFO has a unique role to play in the UK's wider law enforcement and prosecution agenda. Of course, no one's suggesting we can simply prosecute our way out of today's problems. 
This will require all parts of the justice system to do their part. But bringing strong cases to court and bringing airtight deferred prosecution agreements to a close to ensure good corporate citizenship are key parts of protecting our citizens, our economy, and our national reputation. And in the past year, the SFO has shown how it can do this. For example, with our hand in hand with our friends in France and the United States, landing the largest ever in history deferred prosecution agreement for corruption and bribery. You recall perhaps it was 3.6 billion euro and that was after strenuous cooperation with the partners I mentioned and the company itself, Airbus. And our part of the agreement covered conduct in five jurisdictions and involved concerted engagement with the many impacted countries around the world. This exemplary operation offers the blueprint for the future, the gold standard in tackling global economic crime. And this summer, we convicted three defendants over the course of a case that straddled the COVID lockdown like no other. In Yuna Oil, which involved corruption in oil contracts in Iraq, we completed our case against three defendants before the lockdown bit. So all was in, save for the closing statements and the judges summing up. When lockdown sent the entire jury home, jury went home for three months and then returned, God bless them, to one of the few uh, COVID safe or first time, you know, first COVID safe courtrooms that we would find. And they rendered guilty verdicts in for two of the three who had gone to trial. One had already pled guilty and actually he's being sentenced as we speak now, um, but the other two received sentences of five and three years. Moving on from the recent examples, Airbus and Una Oil, I wanna focus on some broader topics with you today. First, how can our government as a whole combat economic crime more effectively? And what's the SFO's role in ensuring law enforcement success? We all know, those of us who study in this area, that one of the key challenges in economic and financial crime is that it covers a very broad spectrum, which encompasses multiple types of threats. Our collective response has to be coherent and strategic, but at the same time, we've got to take into account the very different harms that are caused and that are thought of in this area and talked about in this area, each of which demand a specialist response. So what works for volume fraud won't necessarily work for the kinds of complex frauds we face at the SFO. Now, looking back over the past couple of years, there's already been quite a good bit done to recognize these differences. For example, the National Economic Crime Center was stood up just about two years ago today, and it's brought together domestic law enforcement partners the private sector and government to share intelligence and inform operational activity that combats economic crime. And I'm proud of the SFO's contribution to the NEC. Not only did we help to build the organization, but we've also got five secondees there and we're working closely there, those secondees and us who remain involved with the effort to ensure that our caseworks joined up and that we're using the respective skill sets we all bring to the fullest. The secundees represent our ongoing commitment to the NEC and a firm belief that it's only through joint law enforcement effort and joined up effort that will make a dent in economic crime. The NEC recently launched a national law enforcement campaign known as Otello, which initially targeted crimes like romance, investment, and payment diversion frauds. The goal, raising awareness and encouraging more reporting, which in turn should yield more successful outcomes and prevent future offending. And more recently, the NEX adapted Atello to address COVID-19 fraud, bringing together over 30 public and private sector partners to understand the nature of the threat and to disrupt the very sorts of criminals who are selling fake testing kits and fake PPE to, to 
poor and, and desperate people. In July 2019, the government published a refreshed economic crime plan, which recognized that economic crime is a significant threat to the security and prosperity of our nation and that it impacts all areas of society. The individuals who I alluded to earlier buying some of the fake kit, um, businesses and governments as well. And the plan represents a step change in our government's approach to economic crime in mapping out the UK's future response by requiring joint public and private sector action, both sides working together to protect our country from economic predators and economic crime predators. And the SFO has supported the ECP from the start. Meanwhile, government departments like ours are improving how we work with our partners to tackle specific economic crime issues. One sterling example is the success of Jimlet, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligent Task Force, which links law enforcement with those in the private sector, our FI partners or financial institution partners, to share information effectively. Another example is the NCA-led Foreign Bribery and Corruption Clearinghouse, which coordinates foreign bribery cases to ensure that the most appropriate agency takes the lead and that we don't duplicate efforts, because that's a waste of taxpayer money. We've also engaged with our partners to inform their efforts on companies' house reform and the development of new legal tools like the overseas production and listed assets orders, both of which are part of the Criminal Finances Act 2017. We used the latter for the first time just last month to seize jewelry worth about a half million pounds that were bought with the proceeds of a crime in an SFO mortgage fraud case. And even more recently, we've coordinated across government to ensure that there's a consistent approach with our partners to the current spending review on a system-wide basis, meaning that we're bidding for resources in a way that enables us to collaborate more effectively while also building our individual capabilities in areas such as tech infrastructure, which I spoke about when I had the pleasure of addressing you about a year and a half ago. We all agree that without the technological, technological tools we need to do our jobs, making a significant impact on financial crime will remain elusive. So what would be on my wish list for the SFO if I had a magic wand? Unsurprisingly, a failure to prevent events still tops it. The need for change in this area became all the more acute in light of the Barclays Qatar judgment, which confirmed an incredibly narrow application of the controlling mind test, making it very difficult to hold companies with complex governance structures to account for their fraudulent conduct. Many of you have been part of these discussions over the years, and like you, I'll be watching the developments with interest. Another item on my wish list would be legislation to allow the SFO to use Section 2 powers before I open a formal investigation in fraud and domestic bribery the way we now can in overseas corruption cases. It sounds technical, but it would solve a problem that our intelligence division repeatedly faces where we strongly suspect criminal activity but don't have quite enough evidence to open an investigation and a little bit more latitude with our preliminary inquiries would help us make an informed and early proceed or abandon decision, saving scarce resources if we're on the wrong track. I'd also like to see a tipping off offense in relation to Section 2 notices. Currently, our Section 2 powers allow us to compel information from individuals and organizations that's relevant to an investigation. The tools available in cases I've accepted but which, may, which must remain covert, covert for operational reasons, so outside the public domain. We're concerned that the recipient of the Section 2 notice might tip off the subject of the information we seek, thereby jeopardizing the covert status of the investigation and potentially interfering with it. 
without a tipping off offense, similar to the one found in the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, which is the money laundering investigation, um, um, you know, geared at money laundering investigations and the law around those, we're forced to choose between remaining wholly covert and confidently covert and potentially prejudicing our investigation. A new offense would mitigate the tipping off risk and in some cases, allow us to advance our investigations more quickly. So these are some of the changes that would help our ability to fight crime. And I'd like to explore with you now some of what gets in our way of fighting crime as I sit here today. When you look at the obstacles the SFO faces, I think it's fair to say, simply put, our job isn't easy not necessarily because of specific constraints, but because of the environment and the reality in which we operate. When I was last here some 18 months ago, I talked about the challenges posed by what I called the shrinking world, meaning the increasingly transnational nature of serious economic crime, and especially the ease and speed with which criminals move money and information around the globe. I spoke to you about our responses to the challenges and I wanna re-explore these now in light of our progress and the background that I think we'll all agree is there, meaning the data explosion. There's more and more material to interrogate. We've recently seen a phone with over 300,000 WhatsApp messages and a single computer housing in the region of 8 million emails. Company servers come into our labs, which have the capacity for 80 terabytes of data, the equivalent of 600 to 700 mobile phones. The SFO, like many others in law enforcement, must transform its IT infrastructure to keep pace with the changing techno technical nature of criminality. And we've got to be better equipped to manage the exponential growth in digital evidence investment in digital tools and in the digital skills of our staff is just as important as having crack forensic investigators and prosecutors. We're prioritizing our budget toward this investment, but it'll take some time to deliver on fully. I think it's no surprise that I'd point out the fact that many of the companies we investigate are influential and very well resourced. They use every legal and lobbying avenue at their disposal to fight us, as is their right. We have the capability in terms of our staff and their skills, but the capacity of our organization to fight on competing fronts requires constant prioritization. Similarly, many of our cases involve sophisticated and well-funded individuals who may go to great lengths to hide their, ass, their actions from investigators, as well as distance themselves from the assets they control. They're usually well-versed in exploiting the UK's legal and regulatory framework to do so. Virtually all our cases involve multiple jurisdictions, some as many as 20 or 30. We pride ourselves on our ability to work well with partners in countries all over the world to obtain evidence and also to doggedly and determinedly follow money trails around the world. Not complaining about this. It would be like the captain of a boat complaining about the sea. It's our honor and our job to use the tools and expertise we have to meet these challenges. And I remain optimistic and passionate as we do so. We're also working with government to close any gaps that we all collectively identify. So what further challenges does the future hold for the SFO, separate and apart from the existing, or you might call them baseline challenges, we now have two big new ones, coronavirus and Brexit. Obviously, these events have and will have comprehensive complex and multiple impacts. Exactly how and how much society will change because of them 
is an area rich in, it's a good area to talk about and speculate, but some of the effects are predictable. And one thing's clear, neither Brexit nor the global pandemic is likely to leave law enforcement short of work. Criminals are nothing if not opportunistic. Any change for better or worse can be just that opportunity. We all know criminals are early adapters. We also know crime rises when money's tight and further that economic uncertainty and turbulence puts pressure on markets, companies, individuals, governments, law enforcement, and all the rest of us. While so far the SFO isn't the place where the earliest pandemic inspired crimes have landed, as criminals find more and more sophisticated ways to squeeze money out of the pandemic, we will see them come our way. Investment fraud's one area that's likely to be a growth, growth area. Action fraud, fraud saw significant increases in investment fraud reports last year, and we expect more in the future. And remember, our future is this new post-pandemic world, which isn't even post yet. It's ongoing, as we all know. People who face the stress of a difficult investment climate may consider putting their hard-earned savings and pension monies into high-risk schemes, some of which will be outright fraudulent. We've previously witnessed ethical investments and property schemes that are subject to fraud. And alongside our partners, we are continually horizon scanning and intelligence gathering to see what the next gen version of some of these schemes will look like. In addition to individuals, the pandemic has put money, has put uh, many business sectors under extreme pressure, whether by driving down demand, creating operational difficulties, or both. There may be more temptation to win contracts by any means necessary, and public officials may be more hungry for bribes in exchange for awarding benefits, including facilitating existing operations. Closer to home in terms of our own operations at the SFO, we've adapted well to the change of remote working and we've continued to deliver during the lockdown. I already mentioned the convictions in the UNOIL case. And in addition, we brought charges against a company and 13 individuals across four different cases. Perhaps one of the ones that's most noteworthy is the case we charged against GPT which stands accused of entering into corrupt oil, uh, corrupt contracts for work done for the Saudi Arabian National Guard. As the case is currently pending in the criminal justice system, I'm very limited as to what I can say about that, but the charges are there and we brought them um, during this time. We secured confiscation orders totaling just under 5.5 million pounds against former executives of Afrin who were convicted of fraud and money laundering in Nigerian auto oil deals worth $300 million. And we obtained a deferred prosecution agreement against G4S, a, a DPA with teeth, where G4S admitted in open court to fraud in its electronic tagging contracts with the Ministry of Justice. We accomplished these achievements despite the pandemic, but realism inevitably tamps down our expectations about getting our cases through the court system. Post pandemic, there is no such thing as business as usual in the criminal courts. And while other parts of the criminal justice system may be more affected on a day to day basis, given the pressures to get custody cases before juries and given the size and shape of our trials, they're big and they take time, um, it's, we've got to be realistic. We're likely to see longer lapses between charge and trial. For those of us involved in fighting crime, this is worrying because it impacts our victims and it can diminish the quality of witness evidence as memories fade with time can also lead to the so-called COVID bonus that some criminals are obtaining in the form of diminished sentences. One innovation we welcome heartily is the new Economic Crime Court planned for the City of London, 
which will bring criminal and civil economic crime cases under one roof. But it's going to take some time before that's ready and then before it's ready to list its first cases. It's up to us all who will benefit to build our capabilities to meet the ambition exemplified by this worthy project. Now, Brexit. We work closely with government, law enforcement, and other agencies to ensure we're ready for a range of possible outcomes and to ensure our voice is heard. No one has a crystal ball, but our priority is to strengthen our international security relationships. That's a job we relish and for which we're really well suited as it's been part of the SFO's DNA to build strong partnerships across the globe for years. The focus of the negotiations is on getting the UK um, reaching an agreement with the EU, but of course, and we're working hard to support our colleagues on that, but at the same time, we continue to enhance our capabilities at a domestic, European, and global level. Our overriding goal is to protect the public. If the UK and the EU can't reach an agreement, the UK has well-established and well-rehearsed plans in place. We use tried and tested mechanisms that we have already used for cooperation. And these include Interpol, the Council of Europe conventions and bilateral channels. Of course, there's also the natural bond of those who fight crime, regardless of where they're located, to band together to make sure the bad guys pay. So while our challenges some new and others not so new are significant. We and our partners are working flat out to raise our collective game to meet them. We do this through coordination, better understanding of the threats and better infrastructure. Equally across our office at the SFO, each and every one of our teams is working to meet the particular challenges that it faces one case at a time. It's only through this focus and hard work together across our office, across government, across our country, and across the world that will truly beat back financial crime and deliver the results that the victims and our taxpayers deserve. Thank you. Great, uh, Lisa, thank you uh, very much. Um, bang on time, which is always a good start. Um, so um, various uh, questions coming in and thank you all for, who, to those of you who have submitted questions so far. Don't be shy, please uh, ask away. But I'm gonna ask one question going right back to the beginning of what you said. You pointed out quite rightly that the government has this new focus on fraud. Um, from the outside, it would seem that that focus is manifesting itself more in, I suppose, what I would think of as retail fraud, maybe sort of organized crime fraud. I just wonder how that focus on fraud is being uh, experienced from your chair. Um, what, what, what difference are you feeling uh, uh, as a result of this new focus on fraud? Well, I think the basic highlight is that ministers are talking about it people are talking about it. It's not just yesterday's news. And um, that's obviously heartening for me to see. And of course, as I mentioned in, in my remarks, it's not, you know, what we're seeing now is volume fraud, PPE kits that are sold wrong, materials that are promised that never arrive, that sort of thing. We're working very hard across Whitehall and, and government to talk about the different infractions we're seeing and to try to, to, to develop the right way to look at them in terms of predicting the future. As they say, no one has a crystal ball, but I'm 100% sure that over time, as our more sophisticated criminals figure out how to exploit the turbulence and the um, all the different rules that have come in to benefit people who have been hit by the pandemic, we will see the more sophisticated frauds come our way and we welcome them with open arms. We're looking for them now. We're actively working to see what we can find that is within our remit. In other words, 
the specialist skills we bring. And remember, we're unique in our jurisdiction in bringing together a multidisciplinary approach to our cases. So we take them from start to finish. We open the investigation. We have working on our cases, the accountants and the tech skills people I mentioned earlier and the prosecutors, and then we charge our cases. So that's one of the key items I'm looking at in terms of what's an appropriate case for us to open. It's not simply a numbers game. Okay, it's over a million pounds, therefore it's ours. It's got to require that specialist combination of skills and have the requisite level of complexity to get us being the most sensible agency to take the lead. Can you, can you perhaps talk a bit, a bit more about um, case uh, selection? Um, how are you, you know, choosing which cases to go after? I think some have commented that there seems to be a, a, a more obvious focus mode on fraud than on, on corruption. So how are you choosing which kind of cases to, to, to go after? Because there are clearly plenty to choose from. Sure, and of course, as you'd imagine, since we're dealing with overseas corruption, that often involves getting evidence from other countries. So it may, there may be some time differences in terms of what we will be able to bring to the public eye, but you can imagine, of course, um, how much effort went into landing that record-breaking Airbus corruption case. Um, and that is something that meant we prioritized that case and ensured that we got it through to final resolution, working closely with the French, the US, and the company itself. Um, in terms of, uh, of fraud cases, I'm, I've, I have a, I've seen a narrative that says something like, these are small cases, why would the SFO bother with them? And I don't think you quite asked me that, um, but I think there may be the concern that we're not taking the right cases. And I'm very, very committed to the idea that, for example, the London Capital and Finance case is exactly where we want to be. And it involves many, I think it's by now upwards of 14,000 victims that have lost their life savings. That collectively, we're talking many, many, many millions of pounds and a real stab to our, our reputation, our national reputation to offer safe markets and a safe place to do business. So that is exactly where I think the SFO ought to be. We all, I grew up in Chicago where corruption cases, corruption was a part of, of doing business. And we all, I think there's not a single prosecutor I know who doesn't relish a, a viable corruption case. But there's a range of cases and we've got a, a, a split, different cases come to our attention. We're able to develop different cases at different rates. And I think what you're gonna see over time is a whole range of cases. We have a fairly small remit, really. We're talking about fraud and corruption. Those are the areas in which we bring our cases. So today it may be um, more fraud cases, which I think are valid. And I am very, very proud of the work we've done, especially the work we've done to make sure our victims are getting what they deserve in terms of justice in those kinds of cases. But of course, Remember, I mentioned the case we charged, GPT, involved, uh, that's, that was one of our COVID charging cases, where we've got corruption with the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabian National Guard. That's a corruption case. So I think it's, you know, you'll see, you'll see a range, uh, G4S, the, G, the, the DPA with real teeth, ensuring good economic involvement in our country going forward by having a very strong compliance and audit structure within that company. That's another, that's a, that's a fraud case. And, you know, we're proud of those too. So I think you're going to see a mix of both and not a preference for one or another. Okay. Um, one of the things that you've talked about today and you've talked about previously is the role of uh, DPAs. Um, and I just wonder if you could explain how you approach almost the psychology of DPAs. Um, is it appropriate to give DPAs to, com uh, to companies that haven't self-reported? Uh, clearly, um, you know, we want 
uh, companies to give early cooperation in these investigations and so on. So how do you think about the psychology and, and do we need to make sure there's a bright line uh, that companies understand that is, if you cooperate, then maybe you have a, a DPA. If you don't, then, well, we throw the book at you. Well, I think there are a lot of rules already and guidance around this, but I have been very, very keen since I got to the SFO to increase our transparency. So you'll see, for example, we have guidance out there as what constitutes cooperation. And so we've given, we want to give companies out there an understanding of how we think about that. We've got compliance guidance, guidelines now that give companies a sense of what are we thinking about when we're looking for certain features that are very, very relevant to whether a company has adequate procedures to prevent bribery, which is a, a, a full defense in our jurisdiction, as we all know. You're going to see guidance, further guidance on DPAs this autumn, and I realize we're in the autumn now, but we're in the last throes of, of consultation um, with colleagues who are affected by our guidance on this. But watch this space. You will see that in the next um, number. It's, we're talking weeks, not months. Um, in terms of what we're thinking about, we're following all of the guidance that's been issued in this area. And there's no black and white rule that's gonna kick you out of the box or make me 100% sure I'm gonna invite you in for DPA negotiations. As you know, that's an assessment I've gotta make in the final, in the first analysis, do I invite a company in? And of course, we need early cooperation. We've had a couple cases that haven't involved early self-reporting, but there have been other extenuating factors like the length and breadth of the coordination of cooperation ultimately given that have led the courts to bless those agreements and me to decide as a as prosecutor to invite in those companies to talk to us. One thing we all know as anyone who's practiced criminal and the criminal sphere is we all know what it's like to not cooperate, to get in the way, to obstruct justice. And we obviously are not going to be interested in negotiating with companies that do that to us. That's not on. But can I say there's any one particular factor that's going to be 100% yes or 100% no? No, and I think if you look at all of the guidance that's been issued and all the prosecutorial um, rules around this, you would see that it's a, it's a, there's a balance. There are different factors to be taken into account. And obviously we, we must have cooperation to want to invite a company in, but exactly what form that cooperation takes will vary case to case. Okay, um, so just want to turn to some of the more technical points that you made. Um, so you talked about uh, section two and tipping off. Uh, and certainly I think everyone is familiar with that as it relates to money laundering, as you mentioned in uh, POCA. Um, just a matter of interest, how much risk does tipping off pose to investigations? How often does it happen? How often do you feel that this lack of tipping off offense um, uh, causes you difficulty? This is the problem with developing the evidence base, right? How do you prove a negative? So what we, the, the real risk to us is, you know, we've got a covert operation that we know must stay covert for whatever reasons, lives are at stake or the entire operation will be completely damaged beyond repair if we go out. That's a case where we're gonna think long and hard before we issue a section two notice. Do I have a firm belief that loads of people at, at different banks, for example, have somebody on the hotline to, to call up to tip off about something? I'm not, I'm not a paranoid person. I believe sometimes it's as much a matter of, of, of stumbling into something, but, but an offense and attaching a criminal offense to something does alter behavior. So I was a, a money laundering reporting officer at Goldman Sachs when POCA first came into effect. And having a potential to spend 14 years in jail if you get it wrong did focus the mind. So I'm here to say I don't know exactly how many covert operations may be compromised. 
I do know that it's a construct we have in another area that has had some currency in our jurisdiction and appears to have worked. And what I'm asking for really is a signaling of this is not something you should just stumble into and do by accident. Don't just pick up the phone when you get a section two notice. If we've got an offense, it will make people think long and hard. And then for those who are actually tipping off organized criminals and that sort of um, typology that we may be imagining as we sit here today and listen and speak and, and you and I ask questions and, and think this through, maybe the, you know that gives us a hook. So if we've got the, the dirty person on the inside who's done the tipping off and may have made, let's say, a search completely fruitless because we get to the location and nothing's there, you know, that is someone we can go after. Okay. Um, so maybe back to the question of uh, funding. You mentioned your participation in the comprehensive spending review. Um, your cases are complex, expanding, and, and expensive. Um, so I guess the, the, the headline question is, how much more funding do you think the SFO needs uh, in order to uh, achieve the ambition that you, you have? And perhaps where should that funding come from? We noticed that there's an economic crime levy uh, was announced in the budget uh, earlier this year uh, related to money laundering. So how would you like to see uh, that funding picture evolve? Well, first of all, to the degree you think we're expensive, just think about what we've added to the bottom line. I mean, Airbus brought just under a billion euros to the treasury. We don't take a penny of that. And Rolls-Royce, a half billion. So, you know, if you look at how, yes, maybe our trials are expensive, but look at what we've added to the bottom line. It out, it outnumbers that by- Sorry, I wasn't saying expensive as a criticism. I was just no, noting no, that they, just, are they are time consuming and complex investigations. Ergo, they cost money. Yeah, and I don't feel, I don't feel that you are in any way critical. I just want to remind our listening audience that, that we're not just a cost center. We've actually managed to generate quite a bit for the UK treasury. And we, we are not under the ERA scheme. We don't take it for ourselves in any way, shape, or form. So it goes right over to the Treasury. Um, in terms of how much more we would need, we're not being greedy. I'm not asking for billions and billions. What I want to know is I need, how, where am I? I? I know that I'm facing a data explosion. I know that I need certain systems and certain infrastructure to combat that threat and that and it's not going the other way. We know that it's only going to get worse. So I need the tools in house to really get at that increasing pile of, of uh, our cases are kindly described as data rich. And I also need skilled technical people. And remember, they can go across the street and get twice as much at EY or one of the big four accountancy firms. I need to be able to give them, we, we offer them, I think, the best work you can get in this country. They've got a chance to really sink their teeth into some of the most complicated, challenging work. And we've been working fraud. It may have moved up recently in the government's agenda, but it's always been top of our agenda. And we've been able to offer that even to kids fresh out of school who, who really want to cut their teeth on that sort of work. And we have programs where we train them. We've got an incredibly exciting training investigator program where we just had I'm going to get the numbers a little bit wrong, but something like 2,000 applicants for um, a handful of slots. We've got people interested in doing our work. I, my job is to make sure we give them the skills they need, we train them in the areas where we need the work done, and that then we retain them. And that's the bigger challenge, I think, if we don't get the, the technology orientated support we need to make sure that our, our incoming and current investigators are up on the technical side and then want to make a home with us for a good long time beyond being trained. And so we're going to need funds that are earmarked to supporting the enhancements of those sorts of skills and to having all the tools, the actual infrastructure we need to do that. So, so just to, it's, not, it's not it's not billions it's it's 
you know, we're, I, I am quite confident that we've got a, a healthy budget. We've been able to work well within our budget. It sure didn't stop us from, from getting that billion euro DPA uh, with Airbus. So we've been able to do our jobs quite effectively. It didn't help us, didn't hurt us um, convicting Unoil defendants and getting GPT charged. So I, I, I'm not here to just bellyache and say, I need money. I'm not here with a begging bowl, but I guess I'm here to say um, that we as a government need to think about what does law enforcement need to really deal with today's world where our criminals are have access to unbelievable technology. We need to be able to keep up. It's not going back. We can't unring the bell. And and those that you're trying to prosecute, as you as you indicated, have um uh, access to tremendous resources as well. I mean, I was struck by a comment made by uh, the NCA DG, uh, Lynn Owens, in the, in the Russia report, essentially saying, you know, financially, we can be outgunned by these people that we're going after. So uh, can I take from what you've said that one of the criteria in sort of case selection is not just, um, are we going to be successful, but actually, what what is the the, the, the cost benefit analysis of, of such a, a, a case then? Can we afford to chase this case? You know, to be honest, I am very mindful of the public purse, but it has never featured in whether I open an investigation. If we've got a worthy target, there is no way I'd admit defeat at the outset by saying, oh no, they're too big and bad for us. We can't possibly touch that. In fact, most prosecutors, it gets their blood going. That's Bring who we want to prosecute. We want to make sure we're getting the people who are in the best, who've already made out like bandits, we suspect, and who are in a position to continue to wreak harm and misery on our world. And those are the very people we want to take on. So I, I don't feel we're outgunned. I just feel we need some basic tools to do our jobs effectively. Okay, so it's a kind of couple of questions turning more to the private sector engagement. So you mentioned investment scams, um, COVID related investment scams and, and the like. Um, obviously, many of those are promoted via social media channels. So I guess it would be interesting to get a sense from you as to what more do you expect the private sector to do to help you with your job? Uh, so a specific example there, and kind of just more broadly, what more would you want to see from the, the, from the, the private sector? Well, I think one of the things we want to see is as we're look is we're horizon scanning, I want the private sector to be horizon scanning too. Where are their weaknesses? Where are their vulnerabilities? What, what, what aspects of their technology, their infrastructure, their people have been compromised or have been seen to be vulnerable over this? So let them, they need to get their houses in order the way we are looking to make sure that we are meeting the threats we're seeing. How are they taking that information? Are they taking it in in a way where it's designed to develop solid MI, good management information, to allow the board to make critical decisions? And some of those may be expensive. So, you know, are, are the companies playing it honest and, and really digging in the way we are on the law enforcement side? So I'd expect that of them. And that is, that's proper engagement as I see it. Um, that's targeted engagement where if we're talking about, talking together about the sorts of things we need as we do in some of the fora I mentioned, that they're actually then taking the steps to make sure that they're doing their part to look and see where the problems are and how can they close down any vulnerabilities and gaps, even if it does, even if it is the kind of conversation that no CEO wants to have with the board of directors, that they're looking at that. I'd say also, you know, let's look at what's worked. I mean, Jimlet is a sort of amazing, you know, we in law enforcement are able to talk to the banks now about what they're seeing. I mean, this is not, you know, in my days at Goldman Sachs many moons ago, you know, we, when we were just coming out with the guidelines, we were just writing the Jimlet guidance. Um, we wouldn't necessarily have put money on the fact that it works as effectively as it does. But boy, it does help to have them talking to us and talking to each other within the constructs that everybody faces of data protection and data privacy. 
So turning um, to, to where you, you ended um, on, on Brexit, uh, I think the popular phrase in government is planning for the reasonable worst case scenario, which I've never fully understood. But anyway, how are you planning for the reasonable worst case scenario when it comes to ability to extradite uh, people from the EU to a non-EU member state, information exchange, um, and, and all of that? How are you planning for the 1st of January 2021 assuming a reasonable worst case scenario. Sure. And of course, you know, something like extradition is going to feature way more heavily in Max Hill's agenda than mine, because we're not extraditing people every other day. But if we, you know, for example, if we had European arrest warrants out, you know, we were doing everything we needed to do to make sure they were met, answered, and dealt with in advance of the deadline. So regardless of what we find come January we, January 1, remember this has been in the course of planning for years already, you know, where we have joint, um, joint investigation teams. How are we, instead of having the classic JIT, how are we gonna share information? Let's say we're 50% through a case, 70% through a case, we've sat down to talk to our European partners about how we're gonna manage po you know, if, if the reasonable worst case scenario happens. So there's been as much planning as we can do to exploit the tools that we have now while we have them before they, they arguably or might evaporate. We also really do rely on our bilateral relationships Remember, we had a, I mean, and this is, these are not EU countries, of course, I realize that, but we've had Singaporean um, prosecutors in our office, investigators in our office as secundees. We've had DOJ um, folks in our office as secundees. You know, we've worked on solidifying proper relationships. I have a close relationship with the head of the PNF now through working through Airbus. So through both a long history of working with global partners and also through having case specific experience with them, we have formed bonds where we can pick up the phone and ask that things get done and get put it on the top of your entry rather than the bottom of your entry. And I think those strong relationships are going to work. Also, remember, there was a day before we had European arrest warrants, we had bilateral arrangements, we had um, groups like Interpol, and you know, we do have um, structures in place that have been used over time. So we're, if we have to re revert to using some of those, we have to revert to using some of those. But, and, and I'm not in any way diminishing the importance. I called it out as one of a, you know, our ch a challenge ahead. But remember, our work at the SFO is not purely European based and some of our partners are, are well in other parts of the globe. I also have a, a, a very strong sense that those of us who've been in law enforcement a long time and who've made those relationships over time are not going to stop picking up the phone when when we call each other, when we need something, when we see a bad guy in, in someone else's jurisdiction. We are allied by a very common desire to make sure justice is served. And I don't think that it's purely based on um, whether there's a particular agreement or not. I think those long-standing relationships are going to count for a lot going forward and count for a lot now. It's why we've been able to deliver the successes that we've that I've spoken about today. Okay, um, there's a question um, about whistleblowers, um, which obviously play an important part uh, in this kind of uh, area. Um, could you sort comment about your perspective on protection for whistleblowers in the United Kingdom? Obviously, you have a valuable transatlantic experience. Could you give us a, a sense of the importance of whistleblowers to you and, and, and the protections and, uh, that they have uh, in this country and whether you'd like to see any changes in that regard? Sure. I, you know, of course, I'm not a lawmaker. I'm a law enforcement agency head, so my job is to follow the law. We do appreciate whistleblowers. Our doors are always open. We do have self-reports where people come forward. And, and, and I make a special plea to my compliance officer colleagues who are often very, very troubled by seeing something that's not quite right in their organization. 
we understand that you're in a difficult spot and we do want to hear from you and we'd like to hear what you have to say. There are protections in terms of workplace protection, but if you're talking specifically, and often people are ask me about the, the financial side of it, because that's where the real difference lies in the United States, where whistleblowers are, can be compensated quite, you know, usually the bulge bracket ones get a lot of press. Um, I think we've seen recently the SEC now has a little more flexibility in what it pays whistleblowers. That's a new feature of their law. But in terms of, in terms of our law, I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where we're paying whistleblowers for information. I think that is not, I, I don't advocate that. I understand that that's not part of our system. Frankly, we've had people come forward. Um, I understand the rationale for it because I think a lot of whistleblowers uh, won't work again. And so I understand that, that, um, that there's some thinking behind a system that enables them to not suffer huge financial penalties. But, but we've all seen outspoken people in this country who really believe in doing the right thing and are motivated for the most laudable reasons. And to the degree that they're doing it, um, I mean, without getting too technical, one of the problems is if you don't want to be named, you can't quite get the protection. And oftentimes whistleblowers want to whistleblow anonymously. So a lot of our legislation that is protective is geared around identifying the person who needs the protection. And so that can be a little bit uh, circuitous in terms of how safe people feel. But we do, um, we do have a, a system that, that has worked so far for the SFO. We have had people come forward and we do continue to invite people who, who at least want to have a, an initial conversation without necessarily having anything go forward beyond that to, uh, to, to give us a call. So we're almost at the end, Lisa, and, and thank you so much for your time. But one sort of final question, you've been in the chair for just over two years. Uh, what, pinned to the, the wall in the office uh, that you're allowed to visit from time to time. What, what are your objectives for the next two years? What, what would you like to achieve uh, over the next two years? I'd really like to achieve an incredible sense of focus in our work. And what I mean by that is continuing to hone our skills, to make sure that we are continually challenging what I'd call confirmation bias, that we take on a case and we continue to ask the hard searching questions throughout the life of that case. Is it still a good case? Are we prosecuting the right people? Are, is the theory that we had six months ago still a valid theory? Or was the person we thought was the worst offender in the world actually someone who's come forward and given evidence and we actually believe them and we think they could help us and be more of a, one of our people rather than the bad guy people. So I guess what I'd say is I'm not really asking for, other than what I d addressed in the speech about making sure we have the technological tools we need to do our jobs. I'm really, really, I'll be so proud of us in two years when we are the kind of organization that never hoovers up too much at a search, that never has an overreaching or a, a section two that asks for more than we need, that we are mindful and thoughtful in terms of how we bring our very significant criminal enforcement powers to bear and that we maintain the focus throughout the life of the case. So we're bringing cases into court that make sense to juries, that are manageable, that are able to, where, our, where those who are presenting the evidence in court can do so with clarity and with a conviction and passion to enable the jury to really understand why we believe that we're, we've got guilty people that we're bringing into court. So it's, it's really a matter for us. What does success look like? It looks like us bringing the focus and the discipline to bear that we need to bring sound cases that juries will understand and that will lead to protecting our country. Okay, well, it's a noble, uh, a, a noble objective. We look forward to you uh, achieving that. Um, so we're going to have to uh, come to uh, an end now, but thank you all 
uh, very much for uh, joining us today. Um, thank you, Lisa, uh, for your, your time. Obviously, we hope and encourage you uh, to continued uh, success and greater success and the funding you need and everything else that goes uh, with that, including the, some legislative change. Um, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Thank you to everyone for attending today. And just on the screen now, if you do want to keep up to date with the work that we're doing uh, at Rusi and Financial Crime, do follow us on Twitter at CFCS underscore Rusi. Uh, and sign up to our mailing list that you can find via our section on the, the website. So thank you all. Uh, stay well. Um, have a good day and uh, bye for now.